I don't like to say it quite so bluntly as some people do, but in some ways it's true that most people really are stupid and it's getting worse. Living in an information age, we're supposed to be that though knowledge would increase, it doesn't mean wisdom did. And though there be the opportunities we say in this information technology generation that we live in, with cell phone and television and data being streamed and likewise availability of Googling or Binging or you know using any number of rhythms or algorithms in order to search for information, you would think that we would be smarter. But as we examine sometimes those things that we find true, we test ourselves according to national standards and we look at those people that we esteem as being wise and we find out we're actually pretty stupid. I mean, other nations have children growing up with two or three languages spoken and we struggle with English. We have lots of times with mathematical skills we find ourselves lacking in the capability, much less the ingenuity. We are a consumer-based society and we have become like the Roman Empire in taking in smart people but not putting out. You see, a lot of times people look at something innovative from one of the companies that might be in America and they say, oh, well, that's American ingenuity. Then when you find out some company from, like, say, Technion Israel sold us the idea or sold us the technology, suddenly it's not American-made or inspired, but it is produced sometimes in a place where there's more money to make it work as opposed to creating it ourselves. We're good at creating a luxurious lifestyle for ourselves. We're not very good at creating quite a quote-unquote thinking man's ideology. We don't reproduce intelligence. We seem to be lacking in that department. And you know, so one of the things that my generation, when we were growing up in the Jesus movement, we saw this whole concept that used to be warned about in family programming radio. You know, they used to talk about it, the dummying down of America. How programs on television were getting stupider and dumber, and the scripts were being written for like kindergarten and children age and younger and younger, you know, so that they wouldn't be so intelligent as they would be entertaining and, if anything, playing to the dumbness of the masses as opposed to the intelligence of the individual. And so we find, even so, in programming lots of times, things that appeal to emotional response as opposed to things that appeal to an intelligent response. We don't think and we're not told to think until just recently we even reacted to things more than we acted upon things. As a matter of fact, this last generation now is more conspiracy oriented based upon rumor and innuendo than they are about fact-based. They don't even know what a fact is or how to prove it. They're not aware of what a fallacy is or how to present a logical argument or even how to examine the scriptures to see if they be true. We're not one of those kinds of people anymore in America that is able to prove all things and hold fast that which is good because we don't know how to prove anything anymore. We just take it for granted. Eh, it's true or eh, don't worry about it. God will take care of it. Will he? You see, we're all held accountable for the measure of faith that we've been given. I like my name, Michael. It's kind of a good name. It's got a history behind it. It's got a pedigree. But there's one way I don't like my name in some ways. When I was growing up, I used to get thrown out of class a lot. You know, it's kind of like, well, you know, I kind of get that way now. Sometimes I get thrown off of somebody's Facebook as an unlike rather than a like. <laughs> oh, well. But my mindset was formulated by God in order to create me to fulfill my name. I was designed by the Creator to become Michael, Michael, who is likened unto God, question mark. That's a question mark. It's not a love mark, you know, kind of like that. It's a question mark. So it's like, who is likened to God? Well, Jesus is, of course, you know. 
And then also you could say that, well, who is like unto God? You know, who's like him? Are you? Are he? You know. In other words, my name, if you wanted to ask a question in Hebrew, all you'd have to say is, Mishael. And it would literally mean, who's like God? Who's like an unto God? And that's all you'd have to say. You wouldn't say, who, as one word, is, as another word, likened, as another word, unto, as another word, God, as another word, and then put a question mark at the end of it. No. Mikhail has all of that together. It's a complete sentence in Hebrew. It is a questioning sentence in Hebrew. It's a statement of question in Hebrew. It is, quite frankly, interesting in Hebrew. What can I say? I like the name. That's why it's my name. <laughs> but when you look at who is likened unto God, I see my character contained within that name. I see myself questioning things and going, hmm, kind of like Arsenio Hall used to go, hmm, or the thinker, hmm. You know, we aren't really trained to do that. Now, when I went to Israel, I lived in Israel for a little while. I was sent as a missionary at large. I went to prepare the way, so to speak, for another pastor to go. And I was also going in other reasons, you know, that were part of the ministry, was to visit the ministry that was there and then to be a part of it was at Calvary Chapel, Jerusalem, you know, with Bradley and Antolovich and his wife, Mariana, and their kids, you know, and little ministry that was just getting off the ground, you know, and they were beginning to expand into the bigger ministry they are now. And, uh, I went there, you know, and I was part of living there for a while, you know, and I got a chance to be there for about 14 months, you know, and, and uh, I worked in Israel, you know, I worked as a metapel, you know, metapel, and a metapel is a is a person who takes care of another person, you know, they're like a elder foster care or foster care, so I was doing that, you know, I'd cook and clean and take care of the person, you know, and, and you know, be conversational with them, and then I'd take off at night or daytime whenever to go work in the ministry and then at times I went to Opan in order to study Hebrew you know to who knows make Aliyah someday but I really wasn't planning on it much you know and I also had kind of a wayward wife that was trying to become orthodox that I needed to you know kind of like talk to her and see if she's like you know are you really losing it you know do you really go after this because she kind of ran away and ran off and ran and done her own thing which is kind of weird you know it's like you would think that a person who becomes a Christian wouldn't give up Jesus in order to become a Jew? Ooh, that's a little weird. But, you know, unfortunately, this was my second wife, I think. Anyways, one of my wives. Yes, I've been married for the West. <gasps> God forbid. Oh, well. <laughs> Such a deal. Hey. You know, so she had gone to Israel originally to study, and, you know, it was okay because we didn't have any children, so it was fine, you know, and a friend of mine had paid for her to go and then she decided to stay there. And then she decided to kind of leave me and leave studying and leave off, you know, coming back. And it was like, not so good. <laughs> so eventually, you know, I got a chance to track her down and, you know, see where she was at and what she was doing. And yeah, she went out of her way to go through a Orthodox Jewish divorce ceremony with me. And at first, I resisted it, as any Jewish person can do. You can say, no, yeah, uh-uh, lo. That, you know, no Jewish man has to ever agree to a divorce. You know, it's like, you can't get women in Judaism or in Orthodox Judaism can't get divorced unless somehow, by some pressuring means, by some way that the Jewish rabbis in the rabbinical court can force that man into making a decision that they say is not only his decision, but they lie, but is really only his decision before God to let or give a get to a woman to release her to go be, quote unquote, stained, and she is, from divorce and no longer be fit to be married to anyone else. Because you don't really go and, you know, move on to the next one. Although the story of Ruth is an interesting one. It's fascinating, you know, as far as Jewish culture is concerned. It may not mean make much sense to Gentiles, but in Jewish culture, oh boy, that was a big deal in those days. It still is a big deal in these days. It still happens sometimes in some countries where Jews live together. So, interesting enough is my wife 
when I could keep very rarely get in contact with her, you know, because it was one of those things that she was like, you know, ah, ah, ah. she really did decide that she thought she could be, you know, like whatever she thought she could do, you know, inside of Judaism and become Orthodox and somehow that she was going to witness or be, you know, a Jesus person inside of until the end of, before we got divorced, she had pretty much turned her back on Jesus. She had to go through this public denunciation of my faith, which I didn't, at the court timing and proceeding, we didn't get to the place where the rabbis kept asking me questions, you know. They never asked me, do I believe in Jesus? They just asked me, well, what is this faith that you believe in? You know, they didn't even ask that. They said, why won't you grant a divorce, you know, to your wife? And I said, because I made a vow. I vowed to love and cherish and honor and serve and, you know, till death do us part. I said, you want me to break my vow? No! us. We don't want you to break your vow. But, do you want her to be miserable? Well, what do you think? Do you want me to break the vow that I made before God? Oh, no, no. We don't want you to break your vow. But, do you want her to, you know, not be able to, you know, blah, blah, blah? Oh. Well, you know, the whole court case went on and on. They kept asking me questions. I kept answering according to what the Lord told me to say. And at that time, it was fascinating because they literally were hanging themselves according to Torah law. And finally, the chief rabbinic, uh, the chief rabbi at the time in the rabbinic, you know, he was, he was like mad at me and he was like almost slobbering up, you know, kind of spittle coming down his beard, you know. And I had a beard at the time and I was kind of like going, so, if I make a vow, what good is it if I break a vow? Do you want me to make a vow before God and then break the vow before God? What good would be my word? Do you want me to do? And he was mad because it was as though he wanted me to do it and they would witness it and then they would witness that my word was no good anymore and no, you know, on and on. So anyways, long story short is that they finally put a $50,000 lien against me or some kind of ridiculous thing about how I could, I was forced by civil law to stay in Israel until I granted, according to the chief rabbinic and the rabbinic court, a get to my wife who was petitioning the courts for one so that she could be free to go to do what she wanted to do, then they would release me and my passport so that I could go back to America. Because at the time, you know, I said, hey, you know, I don't care, you know, the cows come home, you know, the Lord's coming back, you know, I don't care, you know, I'm here in Israel. Well, you know, it took about six months, you know. <laughs> finally, you know, at the end of it, I got tired. <laughs> they wore me down, you know. I finally said, fine. You know, I prayed about it, and the Christians at the time were all telling, not the Calvaries, but... Christians at the time were telling me, no, 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 don't, don't give it to her, don't give it to her, she'll come around, she'll come around. And I kept saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, and the Lord was silent. And finally the Lord told me, you know, whatsoever is done of the flesh is flesh, whatsoever is done of the spirit is spirit. That which is actions of the flesh is dead unto the flesh, because our bodies, like Hebrews says in the book of Hebrews, is dead unto the flesh. It is an action that has consequence to our spirit, but we live in a dead body. And sure enough, this agreement kind of thing that the Jews were trying to, the Jews, the rabbinic was trying to get me to sign or not sign, was after I saw how it was done, was pretty evil. Ew. But it was Jewish tradition. So finally I granted the get because, you know, even in Christian tradition, you know, the, the person that wants to leave for the sake of faith can leave, you know. And I personally was devastated by it, you know, it kind of tore me up quite a bit. But, the bottom line is that, you know, she decided she wanted to, so they humiliated her as they do in a orthodox divorce setting. They made her sign a bill of divorcement and then burn the bill and use the ashes to kind of like stain her. They treated her like, you know, just terrible, you know, and actually honored me in some ways, you know, and I was kind of disgusted by the whole thing and I, I kind of once it was done, mourned for quite a while, you know, it, was kind of, it, it, it really kind of shook me up pretty bad about how they do it. And so it was, it was sad. It was a tragedy. But the point being is that when people choose to do things according to their flesh, they suffer the consequences of their actions. They, come, they, come, they suffer the sin of their own involvement in doing that which they should not have done. And those things that were counted as blessings that she should have enjoyed as far as being making a commitment to Jesus and walking in the fellowship of his spirit and love 
she chose to set aside and wound up going into orthodoxy and probably, for all I know, choosing to be, maybe, who knows, rejected by God because one of the statements that she made was that she rejected the God I serve. And that was one of the things she had to sign to get on. She says, I reject the authority of my husband. I reject the God that he serves. I reject... I mean, it was like the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, just on and on. It was like, ooh, this is disgusting. Man, I almost made her into a slave. You know, But um, it, it was pretty bad. you know. And so I used to carry around a little copy of it to kind of remind me. It was all in Hebrew, but you know, such a deal. To remind me of what lengths sometimes people are willing to do when they compromise. And... Each and every one of us goes through those challenges of what we face every day when we walk with one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. And that's sadly where a lot of people are at because they want to compromise their faith in Jesus and get something else with it. They want to play the game possibly of having their cake and eat it too. They don't do all that Jesus said. They do what they think Jesus wants to hear. When you find yourself in compromise of some type, whether it be inside of a church, in a ministry, with a pastor, in a setting, that you involve other people, the bottom line is you have to come to a place of personal prayer, fasting, and revelation from God. I mean, John did when he went to the Isle of Patmos. You know, Jesus gave him a revelation of the entire end of the world you know, and everything else going on. But when you're challenged by things that just... <sighs> ready to tear your heart apart, or do, such as divorce does. And divorce really does tear your heart in pieces. And it's really a challenge for those that haven't gone through one to really understand what divorce does. Because though the person may look like, you know, they may slide through the divorce, find one of the parties, they're not. There's baggage and luggage and all kinds of wounds and scars and things that, you know, you could compare it to something else, but it's really not there. The same way that you can't compare childbirth to anything else. Childbirth is childbirth, and a man isn't going to know what that's like. The same thing is true about divorce. In a lot of ways, you could compare it to some things, but you really can't tell someone that's not divorced what divorce is like. So, consequence means that, likewise, there has to be recompense. Because for recompense there must be reconciliation and you have to reconcile yourself through recompense to the consequence for the reconciliation of your relationship with God. You have to go through this process of development so that God can heal you, create in you a clean heart, make you a new person inside, so to speak, that you would be not of the flesh but of the spirit and cause you to be led no longer by the flesh and things that you could see but by his spirit and the things possibly that you cannot see. Because if you allow yourself to, you can be deceived by lots of things. You could find yourself, like I said, in a certain situation and circumstance where the deception of others may cause your perception to be skewed and you may find yourself in contradiction with the word of God or with a ministry, or with a pastor, or with an elder, or with someone, when reality is, the person you need to talk to and listen is Jesus. Because you see, Jesus himself found himself in a place where no one had ever been. No one had ever prophesied or said what would happen when the Son of God comes to earth. They didn't know. Jesus broke new ground. It was a new understanding. God with us. Worse than that, Jesus said, you don't get it. It's not God on earth only, but it will be God in you. God with you. Become born again. That which is of the Spirit is born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Only he who has come down from heaven can cause those to be born of heaven. Only that which 
is of the Spirit of God can give birth to the Spirit of God. And so he caused Nicodemus to sit back and go, what are you saying? Born again? Born Spirit? Come down from heaven? What? 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 He kind of understood, but he didn't get it. And a lot of times that's what happens with each and every one of us. We may understand in part, and we may understand a little. We may get some of it, we may not get a lot. We may understand a little. We may do stupid things. We may do smart things. But as we become educated, as we become wiser, when we are no longer just dumb, then God chooses to lead us beyond our comprehension, our way of understanding, into His perspective of trusting His way of doing things, which doesn't require that we know all things. You see, that's why you can become a little child and a little child shall lead them in the latter days is because we're not as smart as we think we are. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing at all. And the longer you're a Christian, if you see pastors out there and elders and deacons you know, running around thinking they know it all, you're going to find they're not so wise after all because they're going to have blind spots that are miles wide. But when they don't presume to know it all in any category, but rather are able to trust the Spirit of God to lead them in every category or every walk of life in all their ways, then you find that you don't have to know it all. When it is time, you'll be given the wisdom and the knowledge accordingly as you have studied and the measure of faith that you have for the circumstances that you are in. I myself, in my, my story of my wife and the divorce in Israel and Jerusalem and the rabbinic court, is talked about today. It was the day someone dumbfounded the rabbi. Who, me? <laughs> I like to argue, but it wasn't that good. But it was pretty simple. The statement was because the question still to this day that they have, that they kind of like play with is, I stumped the rabbi because he proud out was saying, you know, you will sign. And I said, will you be there when you sign? You know, will you will sign this again. And I said, will you be there to make the vow for me too? You know, if I break the vow, will you stand before God for me? Boy, was that one mad rabbi. <laughs> Woo, boy. I saw all the rabbis going, you know, a couple of them were like, you know, and one or two of the personal rabbis, you know, um, advisors, one that was speaking English was like, <laughs> and he laughed. He was like, he thought it was funny. So did I. But, you know, I couldn't laugh at the time. It's kind of a serious matter where you're sitting. So the point being is that it was interesting. Now, did I have great wisdom? Did I have great logic? Well, I'm a little logical, but I'm not that smart. <laughs> You know, it's just one of those things, you know. From God's mouth to your ear, you know. I mean, that's the old expression. And God uses, you know, even donkeys. So the point being is that we don't presume to know everything, but we don't dummy down ourselves either. We apply ourselves to study the scriptures so that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by every woman doctrine that comes along, which so easily misleads people. For instance, like, you know, I mean, I can tell you one that I know Calvary Chapels, a lot of Calvary Chapel pastors mess up big time. They think violence is fine, you know. You can go out and, you know, like, be, be gung-ho about it, you know, and I'm like, no. And they mess up the Sermon on the Mount big time because they don't look at the last part, they look at the first part. Now, not all Calvary pastors are that way. Of course not. But there's a lot of Calvary pastors that really have an interesting way of looking at the Sermon on the Mount. You know, and it's kind of like based upon some commentary, but not necessarily a direct study of their own. You look at that Sermon on the Mount, it's pretty blunt what it's saying. And then at the end of it, it's even more blunt about what it says to do. These sayings of mine are what you're supposed to do. Don't do them. This is what happens. Do them. This is what happens. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Boiling, boiled down, pure and simple. It's not confusing. It's not anything that's like some big, huge revelation you need. Love your enemies. You know, judge not. I mean, these are things that are simple, straightforward. They were communicative in Jewish culture, very easily understood. And yet, every Pharisee, every scribe, every Sadducee, of course judged 
because they were constantly judging each other according to whether they were doing the right thing or not. They would make a rabbinical edict out of what their judgment was. Rabbi so-and-so says, Rabbi so-and-so says, the Talmudic reasoning is all about judgment. That's why Jesus said, judge not. And then what measure you judge? Because he knew you would. And because he knew you would, he said, the same way that you do, you'll be judged. So don't judge. Apply mercy. Apply grace. Apply forgiveness. Apply all these other things and principles of letting he who judges righteously judge, which is God, but not you. You turn it back to God. Turn the tables around. And that's what Jesus did when he was being judged. He kept turning the tables around. You know, you know you're not judging me. God is judging me and he who, you know, turn me in will be judged, but you're not being judged. You're just playing the game. You're filling in the blanks. You know, you're just playing the role of, you know, implementer of God's judgment or God's decision or God's will. And so, reality check of all of us is that we're not all so smart as we think we are. Matter of fact, most of us are pretty stupid. And the wiser we appear to be, in some ways, the dumber we are in some other area. It's kind of like God's way of keeping us humble. So, as much as I love to think that, you know, like maybe uh, John Corson is just so wise in everything I've ever read or seen him do, you know, so far, or that, you know, current pastor that I'm, you know, enjoying his teaching, you know, and relating to, is wise, you know, because he's been around for so long and, you know, kind of like been able to, you know, see the floats of and the jets of the things that are, you know, doctors. What God wanted us to do so that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro was that we would recognize the foolish things and just kind of reject them. Because the other things aren't so important. They're not real detail necess necessary for salvation. But the things that are, you know, whether they be works trips or, you know, picking certain days or following certain traditions or getting carried away, those are whims and doctrines that we don't need to worry about. You know, the things that aren't that important or that are important, like violence or, you know, kind of like, you know, defend yourself or, you know, kind of salvation issues, those those get kind of serious, you know. I know for the longest time, you know, there was this kind of idea floating around that, you know, you didn't need to do any Jewish evangelism. And I used to think, really? So you're going to condemn everybody to hell instead? Nice going. <laughs> okay. But we come to a place where God tells us, think on these things. And he does say, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is holy, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. But he also commands in that, think on these things, to consider it. Think about what you're saying and doing. Think about how far your latest new idea, once it's extended out into eternity, does it last? Is your latest dogma or nice allegory or simile or metaphor, does it work in the eternal or just the temporal? Is it a temporary fix to a temporary set of circumstances that you put into place to assuage somebody's guilt complex? Like, you know, the whole idea of age of accountability, which is fallacy. It's not even true. There's nothing in the Bible about an age of accountability. Nothing at all. I mean, that's one of the biggest lies I've heard, you know, modern Christians say. What age of accountability? There's no such thing. It was made up. It was made up centuries ago to make someone feel good about, who knows, maybe because some child died, they said, oh, well, you know, that, all, all dogs go to heaven, so do babies too. You know, it's like, no, they don't. Come on, give me a break. God's just. This doesn't work that way. He knows the beginning from the end, so he knows if the baby growing up would have made a choice or not, so he determines who goes and who doesn't. It's that simple. Pretty simple. But instead of explaining it that way so that you would trust in the Lord, oh no, you know, we're just going to say that all babies go to heaven, of course, so that Susan Smith down the road, you know, in the year 2000, I think three or something like that, she'll kill her babies because they're going to heaven anyways, and she didn't want them to suffer in this world the way they were, so of course they were under the age of accountability, they went to heaven, because she did them a favor. Of course, she's rotting in prison, but the babies are in heaven, right? I don't hear murder by salvation being taught too often. Or salvation by murder, I should say. So you see, men of God aren't always the wisest, and they don't always know it all. That's why we all are told to 
Think on these things. Consider it. Prove it. Make examples of these things that you think you know and then extend it outward into eternity. Because you see, from cover to cover, it's never going to change. Whether we die today or tomorrow or the next day and we move into eternity, the Word of God will still be the same from the beginning of Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. It will have been a contained self perpetuating truth and fact that for that age of God, <laughs> there you go, there's a good one, that God existed within the realm of creation and deciding to delineate that to man in some way of comprehension within that age that he calls it from Genesis to Revelation to the Word of God, that the revelation was of the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and God himself, that dealing with his people and dealing with creation and dealing with the universe as we see in the physical realm, that that quote-unquote age, and I'm not going to become a dispensationalist because I'm not, but anyways, according to that age, because it's an ages to ages life, and God said that ages to ages would continue on throughout eternity, and it would go on and on and on and on and on, and never ending succession that goes on, and there must be something new happening in each individual age in order for it to be an age. So, giving you a little bit of Jewish logic, that being said, that means that the Word of God doesn't change. So, what happens to your perspective of something you think fits now? Does it fit down the road. That's the way I used to say it. In other words, when you have some good idea, think and extend it outward. First of all, to everyone. Does it apply to everyone? Then extend it outward. Does it fit in eternity? Will it work? Does it fit in all of Scripture? Or are you just using some of Scripture to make it work? And the most of the time, the proof of your theology, the proof of your ideology, the proof of your idea or your concept or your doctrine or your dogma or your whatever may be religious statement will be proven false by the word of God because it says that every man be found a liar and God be found faithful. You know, so if it contradicts God in any way, yeah. it's a lie. That's the bottom line. The Bible even says that. But because God will make it that way. But besides that, you just extend it outward and you extend it onward and you extend it through time and you can usually see when it's true or not. And most people don't even bother thinking about it. They just state all this stuff that they got a good idea on and they try to balance it with two or three scriptures and wind up being childish, stupid, dumb. And a lot of people follow it. And that's sad. That's very sad because God doesn't want you that way. He wants you to know Him. The summation of the revelation of Jesus Christ to the world, beside providing salvation to the world, so that we could understand what his purpose and plan was from the beginning of time all the way to the end of time, was to reveal God the Father and him whom God has sent, so that we would know that eternal life is knowing God. That's what eternal life is, to know him and know him who sent him. That's the bottom line. The volume of the books are written of Jesus to reveal him to us of what we are going to be constantly learning of to eternity. We're finite, dumb. He's infinite, smart. We just know what little bits we got. And even Jesus said the little bits you got ain't nothing compared to what we could be telling you. I'm like, let's get over the itty bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot, you know, nothings that we know, and let's move on to put on the fullness of what God wants to teach us about Himself and about His Son. The burning heart. Did not our hearts burn within us? We need to learn. Oh, amen to that one, sister. You know, can I get an amen? I hate that statement. Can I get an amen? Can I get an omen? Can I get an amen? 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 Oh, look. We need to learn the secret of the burning heart. Suddenly Jesus appears to us. Fires are set ablaze. And we are given wonderful visions. Jesus is here. Woo! You know, we're all stoked. Poked. Ready to go for it. But then we must learn to maintain the secret of the burning heart. A heart that can go through anything. Oh, it is, sim it is the simple dreary day with its commonplace duties and people that smothers the burning heart. We get bogged down, worn down, and burned out. Unless we have learned the secret of abiding in Jesus. Much of the distress we experience as Christians comes not as a result of sin. No, not even. 
But because we are ignorant of the laws of our own nature, we don't think through what we should have thought through. For instance, the only test we should use to determine whether or not to allow a particular emotion to run its course in our lives is to examine what the final outcome of that emotion will be. I'm pissed off. But what's the final outcome? Death, destruction. <laughs> oh, maybe I should be angry and say not. Okay. Find a scripture for it. Think it through to its logical conclusion. And if the outcome is something that God would condemn, put a stop to it immediately. You know, I don't think the Lord wants me to condemn that president, you know, the United States of America, because I don't think that God condemns. I think that God so loved the world that he gave the only begotten Son, whosoever believes in should not perish but have everlasting life. I think God wants me to pray for him. I don't think God wants me to chastise him. I don't think God wants me to mock him. I don't think God wants me to make fun of him. I, you know, I don't think God wants me to do any of those things. Do you? Because, you see, right now, Christians think so, and they act so, and they do so. Do you really think that's what God wants you to do? to the President of the United States of America? Hmm. You're the light of the world. What kind of light are you? I'm just kidding, Lord. It's only a joke. And the Bible says, what say it that about those that say it's only a joke? And how does God deal with them? Think it through to its logical conclusion, and if the outcome is something that God would condemn, put a stop to it immediately. But, if it is an emotion that has been kindled by the Spirit of God, and if you don't allow it to have its way in your life, it will cause a reaction on a lower level than God intended. God always wants to bring you closer to Him, not farther from Him. Closer to, not farther from. The determination of what you are doing usually reveals if it's from God or not. The Spirit of God brings you closer. The Spirit of man brings you farther. The Spirit of the flesh resists the movements of the Spirit of God because God will always reveal Jesus. The Spirit of God always points to God. The Spirit of God has not come so that you can run out and start a crusade, you know, and act like you're God and you can crucify people and stomp on them and claim and name and shame and stomp and knock and, you know, make them roll around and bark. That's not what the Spirit of God's about. The Spirit of God is the revelation of Jesus, period. And all the seven spirits before the throne of God are the same. All of it is to reveal God. That is the way unrealistic and overly emotional people are made. They do not allow for the complete realization of the Spirit of God in their lives to give them revelation of what He wants to do, but they just get the feeling and stay with the feeling part not listening to what the feelings are saying or pointing to or God is wanting to do in those feelings. And the higher the emotion, the deeper the level of corruption, if it is not exercised on its intended level. You don't stay with feelings. I've got a, I've got a feeling that tonight's going to be a good night, that tonight's going to be a worship night. No, it's not that kind of feeling. You know, if you stay on that kind of feeling where it's just satisfying the flesh, you'll never get to the satisfaction of completion of the Spirit of God working in your life to bring you to see Jesus, to bring you to know Jesus, to bring you to walk with Jesus, talk with and hear His voice. It is not exercised on its intended level if the Spirit of God has stirred you. You make as many of your decisions as possible irrevocable and let the consequences be what they will. Do your decision-making by God leading you, not you leading you. As long as the Spirit of God is telling you to do something and you know it, do it. The results are for God to determine. It's for God to lead you, God to guide you, God to abide in you. We cannot stay forever on the mountain of transfiguration, basking in the light of our mountaintop experience, or in some people's case, let's do a worship service, you know, or let's have a revival. You know, I mean, they, they act like, you know, you got to keep reviving yourself. You know, were you dead every time? I mean, what happened? Is your faith dead that you only get alive back in a revival? So you got to have a revival every five or ten years or every five or six weeks or every two or three days? I mean, Lord, revive us and I've got my revival. That's about all I need. But we must obey the light we have received there from the mountaintop experience and we must put it into action to do what we have seen and what God has told us to do. When the 
disciples that were on the mountaintop, Peter, James, and John, saw the revelation. They were so wonderfully inspired. They were going to build, you know, little churches and little temples and little steeples for peoples. You know, and went to the Father and the Son, or went to, you know, all three. You know, whoever they saw, Moses and Elijah and Jesus, and yeah, yeah, you know, do the wrong thing. But instead, God said. Now notice the word God said. They heard what God said. He said, "This is my beloved son. Listen to him." And Jesus told them. And they were told to obey and to follow Jesus, not to build something for them. They would have done it out of their emotional response, not out of their devotional attitude of relational, emotional attitude of relational conversation with God. There we go. Devotional attitude of relational conversation with God. In other words, your devotional time shouldn't be a one-sided thing where you read it, you know, and you got it and you go, you know. No, it's supposed to be you read it, you get it, you think about it, you consider it, you go, well, Lord, what do you think? What do you, how does this apply in my life? What, what, how do I make this work in my life? Not just a, like most pastors do nowadays. Well, the personal application of my sermon is going to be A, you do this, B, you do this, C, you do this, and D, you get this. Yeah, you know, telling the Holy Spirit what you're going to do, you know, just... I don't know. I think you're keeping it kind of like on a fleshy level there, buddy. But, it's all up to you. Okay, fine. We cannot stay forever on the mountain, but we must obey the light we receive and put into action. When God gives us a vision, we must transact business with Him at that point, no matter what the cost. The scripture says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Abraham learned the hard way. David learned the hard way. Jesus, we're told, learned obedience by the things that he suffered. I don't know about you. Me? I've suffered a lot. I've suffered the highs, the lows, left fields, the right fields, the outfields. I've even been batter up a few times and thrown a few pitches. You know, I don't like being on the team. I'm sorry. I would rather be where God wants me to be, either in the dugout, or an umpire, or a groundskeeper, or the guy that puts the stripes on the baseball field, than to always have to be the one who's wearing the uniform and scoring the runs. You see, not everyone is meant to throw a pitch. Not everyone is meant to be at bat. Not everyone's going to be the announcer. Not everyone's going to sit in the stands. Somebody's got to do the work. And while it may be entertaining to watch a baseball game, and to see all these things in different parts that work together in order to give you some kind of entertainment, the only real score is that which is in heaven. And if you score with the Son of God in having Him anoint you and appoint you to do what He's told you to do, then you yourself already know what God wants you to do. And all you need to do now is just simply obey.